recently, you know, I had looked into a number of the large Chinese tech companies. So, example, so you know, we've had Alibaba, and we've had Tencent, we have Baidu. I found Tencent a really interesting uh, case study out of all of these companies. About three months ago, I opened a position in Tencent stock at around $57 to $58 per share. I did a video to go with it explaining why I was buying Tencent and my long-term thesis, but my position was a relatively small one compared to how much exposure I ideally want to have. So the plan was to invest more into Tencent at a later date, which I did this week, buying at the same price in which I'd initially opened a position at, at around $58 per share. So we're getting close to 10% exposure now, but ideally long-term, I want 10% exposure in my portfolio to Tencent. And we will recap on my valuation of Tencent stock at the end of this video. But the majority of this video is gonna be centered around Monis Pabrai's latest interview. It was actually almost two hours long, but in the interview, he gave a very interesting take on what makes Tencent such a dominant company and why it could be a compelling investment opportunity. I found Tencent a really interesting uh, case study out of all of these companies. I then went and read everything Koos Becker had to say. I said, this guy is interesting because for 20 years he doesn't sell this thing. And Koos Becker talked about Punima. I said, okay, this is good because now I can finally understand because NASPERS has had a stake in Tencent and they've had a they've had two board seats for a very long time, right from the time they went public, I think maybe after that. And so Koos Becker has been on the board for a long time. And if somebody knows Pony Ma, who is an outside shareholder, it's Koos Becker. And in the NASPERS letters and the NASPERS transcripts, which I went through about you know 18 years of those, there is a lot of commentary on Tencent and on Ponima. And what Koos Becker said, he said, look, there is no management team on the planet in any tech or non-tech business anywhere in the world that is better than Tencent. Now, if you look at the numbers for Tencent, you would not argue with that statement. Okay, I mean, Tencent went from nothing to becoming one of the largest market cap companies anywhere in the world. And it has dominated the businesses that they're in. They dominate in messaging and payments and video games and so on. They dominate a number of categories throughout. And so then I said, why does Koos Becker think that of all the businesses around, Tencent is the best? I said, is he biased? Why does Koos Becker think that Pony Ma is better than Jeff Bezos or Pony Ma is better than Jack Ma? And I had an aha moment. I said, whoa, I think I figured this out. So what I realized is if you look at these seven or eight companies, you know, the three or four in China and, you know, the four or five in the U.S., there are actually only two of them that understand capital allocation well. The two uh, large tech businesses in the world that understand capital allocation well, according to me, are Amazon and Tencent. I don't think the others, the others understand it, but I don't think they can execute. I'll explain why I say that. And I realized that basically Pony Ma has a very simple business model. And I don't think he's ever going to describe that business model to anyone. So here I am, the Indian guy has to describe the business model because he won't, okay? And uh, we had to do that in Arvind's class, you know? So the business model is really simple. He has two businesses. One business that he has is his army of software engineers. I don't know how many engineers he has, maybe 25,000, maybe it might be 50,000, but it's a large army of software engineers. And uh, these, this army of software engineers, the, the way the software business works is that the productivity difference between an incredible engineer and just a good engineer could be a thousand to one. So you, you would be willing as a company like Tencent 
to even pay $50 million a year to a truly, truly incredible software engineer. And Pony Ma understands that really well. And he's really good at sifting through, you know, which are the rock stars, superstars. And he made sure that those guys are well taken care of, et cetera. So he's got this army of engineers. It's got this, it's, it's basically a massive bazooka that he has with this army of engineers. And he decides where and how he wants to fire the bazooka. And they, they, the way they fire the bazooka is for the most part, even if they have some misses, they end up with this total dominance. So for example, they have total dominance on video games. So when, when Tencent makes like, for example, they made $15 billion cash flow last year, Pony Ma goes to his digital army and says, what do you need? How many more engineers would you like? And the math is really simple. Every billion dollars you spend gets you at least 5,000 great engineers. Okay, so they tell Pony Ma, Pony, give me a billion. So Pony says, yeah, that's okay. Here's your billion, but that's not enough. Can you take 5 billion? And they say, no, we can't handle that. It's hard for us to hire five or 10,000 engineers I cannot hire 25,000 great engineers. So Pony says, it's so sad, but it's okay. Here's your bill. Now Pony has 14 billion left. So then he goes to his business number two. His business number two is he's got 30 digital war muffins. Okay. And he says, you know, these losers in business number one, they can't use my money. So here's 14 billion. Have fun. And then they go, and they invest that in a, some of it will be whole acquisitions, but most of it is small minority stakes in a number of businesses. Okay. And that digital Warren Buffett, which is not one guy, maybe, you know, 20, 30 guys, put that 14, 15 billion to work. And just to make sure that all the money is used, Pony makes sure that they spend a little more than the cash he generates because it bothers Tony. It doesn't bother Sundar that 70 billion earns less than 1%. It bothers Ponima. And so Ponima doesn't even leave $100,000 with him, himself. If he makes 15 billion, he spends 15.5 billion because he wants to borrow at 1%. He doesn't want some checking or savings account giving him. So he makes sure that when bazooka number one cannot use the money, he puts it into bazooka number two. And when he once he's fired both those bazookas, he's got no money left and he's very happy. Luperta. Okay, model number one, bazooka number one, earns 65% annualized return on capital invested. Okay, day in and day out. Any billion he puts in, historically has made 65% a year. Model number two makes 35% a year. What a terrible business, okay? So he's just got these two models. One has been pounding out 65% a year, and the second one has been pounding out 35% a year. So I told you there were only two companies, two large companies that knew how to do this, with using all the cash. What Tencent does actually runs circles around Amazon because Pony Ma is never going to hire a driver or a warehouse operator or some, you know, freighter aircraft pilot and put them on his payroll. He's just not interested. He's only going to hire software engineers. And so when some business needs drivers and warehouses and all that, Pony Ma is going to have a minority investment in that business through his bazooka number two. So he has a stake in PDD and JD.com and Meetwan and all these companies that do all this crazy heavy lifting. He still gets the upside on those, but they're not on his payroll. Given the superiority of the Tencent model, 
it would not surprise me that if we look 10 years or 15 years from now, that it's the most valuable business on the planet. And to a large extent, I feel that they may even be able to transcend a bunch of stuff that the CCP is throwing at them. So I think Monish's view on Tencent is very interesting. And although his way of explaining is very anecdotal, I'll do my best to put it into facts and figures briefly. Unlike most of the other big tech companies around the world, Tencent doesn't hold tons of cash on its balance sheet. It prefers to reinvest all of its incremental cash flow back into the business or into other businesses that can yield a high rate of return for them. This keeps the perpetual growth machine that is Tencent's business going and unlike most other businesses, prevents size from being a real barrier to future growth. For example, Tencent's cash position is currently around 30 billion US dollars, about equal to the cash that the business throws off on an annual basis. In comparison, its close rival Alibaba, their cash position is over 70 billion dollars today, more than double what the business produces on an annual basis. And so although Tencent's operating business is fantastic and it has a very long runway for growth when you look at the industries that they're in, it's the DNA of the business and the unique model of management that makes me want to invest in Tencent. And it seems like it's what makes Monish Pabrai very interested in Tencent, a business that has historically earned in excess of 30% return on incremental capital, selling at a PE of 20 times is very attractive in my eyes. And they have so many levers to pull and potential avenues to explore. So in the operating businesses, it's gaming, digital ads, payments, cloud, music and media, and then any one of the up and coming technology companies who they spot and see can yield a good return on an investment they can purchase shares of or buy outright. That is the culture and model that they have created and they are one of the best in the world at doing it. This gives me faith that my valuation of Tencent is actually conservative and at today's price, the investment would exceed my target rate of return with some margin of safety. Although obviously you have to remember, this is just my opinion on what could happen in the future for Tencent and these are my forecasts. As you can see, I'm valuing Tencent at around $74 per share uh, on a base case valuation that implies around 15% growth and no margin expansion or $66 per share on a bearish case. That is made up of the intrinsic value of the operating businesses and then also the value of the equity portfolio in four to five years time. I will say the equity portfolio, it's hard to actually come up with exactly how much the equity portfolio is worth because you have a lot of private companies, you have some public companies, you also have some holdings that are just not disclosed. So we're taking what we think the potential minimum amount will be. Here I've got 200 billion. And it's conservative when you think that the business has historically grown well above a 25% compound annual growth rate for some time. Uh, and due to the reasons that we've covered here and that Monish talks about more importantly, I'd be surprised if that momentum slowed too much in the next four to five years. Now, I'll be keeping a close eye on Tencent to see if it drops further from where it is today, or at least where I bought it, which is around that $57 to $58 per share mark. I did add to my position. Like I said, it's now getting closer to 10% of the portfolio, but ideally I want my exposure to Tencent to be around 10% of the portfolio. And although Monish doesn't have to disclose or it's, it's not public knowledge that he's invested in Tencent or Naspers, nor does he admit to being invested in Tencent or in Naspers to get exposure to Tencent, it would be odd if he talked so favorably about both businesses and didn't invest considering that they're selling at reasonable prices at the moment. So take that as you wish. I just happen to think his take on Tencent is very interesting and is similar to how I think about Tencent and I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. So let me know in the comments what you think of Tencent. Do you think Monish Pabrai owns Tencent or Naspers even though he doesn't need to disclose it? If so, I'd be happy to hear that I have a fellow investor in Monish Pabrai on board in Tencent or either through Naspers into Tencent as well. So let me know in the comments what you think. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new around here. I'll also leave a link to the Patreon in the description if you want to support the channel and get some benefits and exclusive content in return. That's going to be all for this video, guys. Thank you all for watching. I will see you all in the next one.